All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Roofstock. Welcome to the first ever Rooftalk Summit. It's so great to see such a packed house here at our Oakland HQ. And I believe there's a, a, a good group of folks also participating online, so welcome as well. My name is MJ Han, and I'm in marketing here, leading product marketing and brand. And Rooftalk Summit was born out of the idea, a lot of it actually came from users and customers like you guys that wanted to glean insights around what's happening in the industry as well as what is Roostock doing in terms of programs, services, and tools. And so we thought that we'd put together this day to help us kick off, actually today's the first day of the Lunar, Lunar New Year, so Happy New Year, to kick off the new year with hopefully a great way um, for you guys to take away some things that are actionable in your own investing journey. So um, to kick things off, I'm going to uh, talk about a little bit of the agenda for the day. Um, we have two keynote sessions that are brought to you or can be presented by our executive team. We've got Gary Beasley, our CEO, Rich Ford, our chief development officer, kicking things off with the state of the real estate market. And then we have uh, Ketan Barbaria and Suresh Rinivasan talking about a peak under the roof and literally for you guys who are physically here peak under the roofstock roof of what's happening here at roofstock um, we will be sending out the video a couple days after so for those that, that are online or for those that want to share with other people that'll definitely be available um, and then for those that are staying here uh, throughout the day we have a great afternoon so Roostock Academy is going to be putting together three breakout sessions. And so you guys will be able to choose from each of those three, one of two sessions. They'll be held either here in the, in the main stage or in Skywalker. All of our conference rooms here have Star Wars names. Skywalker is the big room um, back there. And um, yeah, so you guys can choose from one of those two sessions. For those that are participating online, we will be sharing those um, sessions at some time, like maybe a couple of weeks from today. Um, so don't worry, you're not missing out. And then we'll have lunch at noon and then some networking and happy hour later to close out the day. So we've got a lot of roosters here, all wearing either these blue shirts or the Teal Roostock Academy. So don't be afraid to go up to any of them and say hello. Um, and without, Further ado, I think I'm going to hand the mic over to Gary Beasley to start to kick things off. Thank you. Okay. Um, can you guys hear me? Let me just make sure you can hear me. To, okay. I'm seeing a nod. Awesome. Hear you. Um, and I, and I think I can hear you guys as well. So um, I'm looking forward to some Q&A uh, afterwards as well. Uh, Rich and I are going to uh, spend some time answering your questions. So we'll try to get through the slides in relatively short order, but, but there's a lot of material to cover. So first of all, I apologize for not being there in person. Uh, I'm actually in uh, Oxford, Ohio, moving in one of my daughters to college. So I, I appreciate this hour respite of lugging heavy bags upstairs. So this is a, a, a fantastic way to take a break. Um, my, uh, my background is, I, I've been at the intersection of real estate and tech for most of my career. Um, I did, I've done traditional real estate um, back out of college and much of my earlier career was in the resort industry and hotel business. I actually ran Joie de, de Vivre Hospitality for a while is a boutique hotel company. I, I did resort investing for many years. So um, I've got a kind of a combination of a kind of traditional real estate and finance background. And then um, in the early 2000s was the CFO of a company called Zip Realty, which was uh, one of the first online residential brokerages. It's actually quite similar to what Redfin is today. Um, and um, so that's where I sort of got exposed to an online uh, residential model, then we were one of the first to put complete internet uh, or listings on the internet, et cetera. 
Um, and we took that company public in 2004, so that was a great kind of life experience uh, and professional experience. And then more recently, and what's more relevant to Roofstock, um, with uh, a couple of partners, formed a company called uh, Starwood Waypoint Residential Trust and took it public in 2014 as a REIT. And we were one of the first uh, public companies to own thousands of single family rental homes. And I learned a lot through that, uh, through that experience and which was it, and helped form the basis of the thesis here for Roofstock. Um, and originally from the Midwest, I went to college at Northwestern, studied economics, and then um, moved out to California for Stanford for my MBA. Okay, so um, what we're gonna do now is um, talk about Roofstock. Uh, first, I'll spend a few minutes talking about it. We're gonna do a deeper dive um, with some of the, the team there in the office. But just at a high level, for those of you who are less familiar with it, um, the idea with Roofstock really has been to build a marketplace for single family rental homes that can transform the way properties bought and sold. Um, my partners and I founded the company, bought thousands of houses, renovated them, uh, managed them, et cetera. So what we wanted to do was, was figure out a way properties could trade much more efficiently without having to move the tenants out, which is horribly inefficient. It's bad for the tenants, it's bad for the neighborhoods, it's, it's often bad for investors because you don't have a lot of vacancy and things like that. So what we wanted to do is apply technology to this problem and create a marketplace that could make investing stock market simple. And so, so what have we done in this, in this time? We've, we've uh, spent about, the company's been around for about five years. Our marketplace has been around for about, uh, active for about four, four years. Um, we've raised about 133 million of venture capital. We've uh, you know, invested a lot in systems, data science, uh, product, technology to, to really attack this problem. Um, we've expanded geographically. So now we're in about, uh, we're in over 70 markets around the country. It's, it was fun, and I mentioned I'm here in, in Ohio. Um, and so I was able to drive by one of the properties um, that we, we just bought on behalf of, of uh, a client uh, recently. And it was wonderful. It's a nice neighborhood just outside of Cincinnati. And um, it's pretty cool to, to show my family um, that we are expanding to, to a, lot of, uh, a lot of smaller markets as well. So um, we're, we're, we're really building a marketplace now that has some unique characteristics. And one of the things we're really proud of is over 75% of our uh, buyers are, are actually first time real estate investors. So I don't know, um, I'd love to see by show of hands, uh, how many of you out there already own one or more rental properties? Okay, um, so that's, that's a decent amount, but it's still a fair number of first time investors as well. So what we've done is designed this, the, the company and the platform to cater to uh, anyone, whether you're you're new and you're just sort of dipping your toe in the water, or whether you already own a portfolio of homes and, and you want to sort of figure out how to how to optimize it. There's also um, about 93% of our of our properties are are uh, our investors rather are buying not where they live, um, which is which is really powerful. In the past, about 70% of all um, homes have been purchased within an hour's drive. And so breaking down these geographic barriers is, is really important. And then also um, a, about 57% of our homes sell inside of 15 days. So that, that's another important thing to think about. Um, we're creating a really, really good liquidity for, um, for investors. So whether you're on the buy or sell side, these, these properties are selling quicker than through traditional channels. So um, at the same time um, that we talk about the, the business itself, um, those of you who are in our offices, hopefully you could, and are able to meet with a number of our team, uh, hopefully you can see what we're really working to do is create a great company. So uh, most companies uh, 
that become great companies are able to attract really good people, create a really positive high performance culture and just create a, a great work environment. And that's what we're working to do. And I think both through our technology and the innovation that we're applying to these business problems, we've been recognized by uh, Forbes, Red Herring, Entrepreneur Magazine, Benzinga as, you know, with various awards. And then also we're equally, if not more proud of, of some of the awards that we've gotten for our culture and our values as uh, being recognized as a, a great place to work um, for many years running. So we're going to talk now a, a bit about the economy and um, the real estate outlook in, for next year. And I'm spending you know, as much or more time actually talking about the economy first because the, they're, they're so linked. The, the real estate market and, and the economy are so linked. So I'm going to start off talking about some of the just some observations about what's good and what's not so good uh, about where we are. Maybe just to take a step back to last year at this time, I was feeling, uh, I would say more, you know, more pessimistic than I feel right now going into this year. If you remember, we were in the midst of a government shutdown, um, the stock market crashed at the end of last year. There was a lot of pessimism in Davos from a lot of the global leaders, didn't know how tariffs were going to be interpreted by the market. And there was a lot of talk of potentially impending recession, et cetera. I would say fast forward 12 months to today, it, it feels different than it did then. And I'll talk about a few of the reasons. One, we've continued this economic expansion, uh, which has now been 127 months in a row of growth. So if it's, it's the first time since the Great Depression, we've gone an entire decade without a recession. So um, that that's, Pretty impressive. Uh, job creation remains uh, strong, not as strong as last year, but still strong. Over two million jobs added this year. Unemployment is at a 50-year low, and um, and also interest rates are at you know near historic lows. Last year, um, you saw a rate. You know, in 2018, you saw a rate increases. Last year, we saw three. Uh, 25 basis point uh, decreases from the Fed. And that's creating uh, a low interest rate environment that, that is, uh, does create a healthy environment for the economy and, and for real estate as well. Um, I would say trade tensions uh, are easing some. Uh, there, there's still some risk, which we'll talk about, but with the, the signing of phase one of an agreement with China, uh, there's been pro there's been progress with some unilateral agreements. Um, I would say that, that it, you know if you looked six months ago, there, there was a bit more uh, concerns about that. There still are plenty, but I'd say that's better than it was. Um, the stock market had a had a terrific year, uh, 31 and a half percent increase in the S and P 500 last year. Dropped about 4.4 percent. So. Um, I think what we're seeing is the market um, reacting to you know, good earnings growth and a, generally a you know a pretty stimulative environment that that is helping uh, fuel this continued uh, growth. And then and as the stock market goes, oftentimes consumer sentiment goes, and so coming off a year of a, of a really strong equity market, um, consumers generally feel pretty good. We're we're near an 18-year high of how people feel about the economy, and um, as as you you guys all know, the the by far the biggest contributor to gross domestic product is consumer spending. Um, now, growth this year uh, or last year, we haven't seen the final numbers, but we'll likely end up about two percent, maybe a little over two percent GDP growth versus about three three point one percent the prior year. So growth, while our expansion has continued, uh, growth is slowing. So then, now let's talk about maybe some of the challenges. Uh, one, I, I mentioned that the that, that trade, uh, the trade impact has been uh, getting maybe um, dissipated a little bit, some of the concerns, but they do exist. And the tariff impacts create uncertainty. And uh, as someone who studied economics, I can tell you that, um, uncertainty first of all 
tariffs are not a very popular concept with economists, but uncertainty created by tariffs um, makes um, businesses oftentimes slow their spending, slow their investment, because they're not sure what the impact is going to be or how these are going to be interpreted. It's like having an unclear tax policy and you know, tariffs are a tax. So it, it, I think one of the reasons I, I would argue that growth was 2% this year was some of the impacts of these tariffs. Um, and growth globally is, is relatively tepid. Um, and we've had pretty weak growth in Europe, Germany, which is normally kind of the, 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 the you know, uh, um, strongest economy in Europe for growth has been about 0.6%. Um, China hit a 30 year low in, in growth. So uh, that's not great because these are all big trading partners. So when you combine the, the, the tariff impacts with generally weak growth, um, that, that is creating a little bit of, of concerns. The third is an interesting one, budget deficits. Um, you don't hear a lot about our deficit situation um, this year. I think one of the interesting things is, um, uh, despite the fact that we've we've got uh, you know Republican administration, typically the Republican party's been had been really more focused on spending um, and and controlling the deficit. That's not something this administration's focused on. Um, the benefit of that is we could spend lots of money and stimulate the economy. The, the negative is at some point, um, it, there is probably a day of reckoning when we have trillion dollar deficits like we had in 2019. Ultimately, a lot of people think that ultimately leads to higher interest rates. Um, we're not seeing that yet, but we do have a $23 trillion debt today. So that's something I think uh, my sense is um, over the next, um, administration over the next four years, something we're probably going to need to address and and that that could have a negative impact on growth to the extent you start having to uh, reduce spending. Um, and I would say um, this fourth point, um, uneven prosperity. We, we've had strong job growth, as I mentioned, um, and and in many aspects of the economy, there's been growth, but, it, but there have been some sectors left behind, and I mentioned manufacturing and farming as two of them that have, that have been challenged in the last year. We've had massive farm subsidies to sort of make up for some of this impact. Uh, part of it's, you know, part of it's weather, part of it's tariffs, but there's been a, you know, a lot of challenges with farming. And then the manufacturing sector um, really has, has been hurting this, despite some of the efforts to prop up manufacturing. Um, You've, you've had, um, you, know, uh, you know, and some jobs being eliminated by technology, obviously. So, um, so that, that prosperity being, being applied or growing unevenly is creating a wider and wider wealth gap, which has broader implications, um, you know, just for, um, for society and, and for um, uh, elections and things like that. So that's just one thing I think to, to keep in mind um, that this prosperity has not been evenly applied. And then, um, finally, uh, geopolitical uncertainties are there. Um, we've got things happening in the Middle East, which, uh, again, markets hate uncertainty. Um, same with Brexit. We've had a number of kind of bits and starts. We now have Boris Johnson and a path towards uh, what looks to be, uh, you know, Brexit that will be, you know, I think the market is assuming it's going to be relatively smooth. Again, that could change overnight, but but these things that create un uncertainties are not um, ideal for the markets. And then finally, we obviously have some domestic political turmoil um, today. We've got um, an impeachment process going on right now in the Senate, um, election year, and an increasingly polarized electorate. Um, and it will be usually in an election year, uh, you tend to see the economy doing pretty well uh, and, this, and the market doing pretty well because the incumbent, uh, the incumbent administration oftentimes will do whatever they can naturally to, to have a strong economy going into an election. So it, it'll be interesting to see whether that natural tendency will happen or whether it will be offset by um, some of the challenges we're having uh, just from some of this uh, domestic uh, turmoil. 
So uh, this is an interesting chart. You know, just to remind everybody, um, I think the, the the takeaway here, I would say, is there's general consensus. We're nearing the end of this expansion. Uh, we, we've had 14 recessions since the Great Depression. Typically, they've been about six and a half years apart. It's been 10 and a half years since our last one. So it, it's presumably only a matter of time until we get one. Um, however, given some of the, the uh, points that I made earlier, it's not feeling imminent that there will be a recession necessarily to me in 2020. Um, the, the Fed is forecasting only about a 25% likelihood of, of a recession. Uh, the majority of economists think it's probably sometime in the next couple of years that um, it won't be, it, it's not something that we likely could stave off um, for much more than that. But we'll see. Um, we'll, we'll see how things, how things pan out. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about housing, which I know uh, you guys are here to really dig into. Um, just at a, a very high level, we remember back um, during uh, kind of uh, during the peak of, of home ownership before things started to correct, we had close to 70% home ownership. That dropped uh, into the low 60s. It's now back to close to 65%. It's up about about 0.4% from last year. It's in, and the historical average has been just over 65%. So you've seen owner, home ownership drop and get back to a bit of an equilibrium. Home prices are still growing, um, but at a slower rate than than they were uh, a year ago. So. So median home prices, there's lots of different measures of it, depending on who you look at and how it's measured. But generally, uh, I would say up about 5%, a little over 5% on average. Um, a lot of the higher end homes have, have been appreciating at slower rates, and in some cases declining. What we've seen is home prices increasing faster at the lower end. And um, it, which is, you know, it's, Interesting because that's actually where a lot of our business is kind of more kind of um, homes in the 75,000 to 250,000. That's where a lot of the homes on, on the rooftop tend to trade. The, the appreciation for those types of houses has actually been better than, than more expensive homes. And then keep in mind too that home prices at, at nationally, the only time that those have ever dropped since we've really been measuring this since the depression really um, was in this period of 2007 to 2011 our great recession where we did have five years of declines of home prices nominal home prices if you looked at um, that index prior to then it had always gone up in some some years a lot some years a little but it was always kind of up into the right so there tends to be a, a stickiness downward on prices viewed viewed as a portfolio nationally. Um, also, uh, when you look at an, another uh, measure of how housing is doing, is there, the pace of home sales is about 5.4 million. Um, that's the, the latest pace from November. It's down slightly from the prior month, up a bit from last year. Uh, pending home sales up modestly. Uh, mortgage rates are low. So, so I guess I interpret this as um, sort of a soft landing for housing. Um, you know, I think you go back last year, prices were were increasing more rapidly. It's now come down to a more sustainable level. I think you, normally prices of homes increase, you know, three or four percent a year in many markets. Um, the, the, the long-term average is in that range. Um, some markets a little bit higher, some a little lower, but that's generally the average. And so I think we're working to a more kind of stabilized um, rate of, of inflation, home price inflation. And then overall, I would say, um, we take a step back, the, 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 the outlook for housing is, is strong for lots, lots of reasons. Um, there, there's forecast from lots of different areas about what household formation is going to be like. And um, Harvard's uh, Joint Center for Housing 
came out with a study that, that's projecting 1.2 million new households per year through 2027, and that the majority of those households will be renter households. So that I think is an interesting data point when we, when we think about um, you know, the impact on single family rental homes as an investment. It's it, one of the things I like to describe for people who are looking at the sector as an investment, as an asset class, is a lot of them have either invested in multifamily or think about multifamily as a way to play housing. And it is the difference with apartments versus single family homes is it's a lot easier to build apartments. You can go, it seems obvious, but you can go vertical. Um, and homes, you, you can't. And so you have scarcity of land. And it's, it's oftentimes because it is using more land, you've got permitting issues. Obviously, the land cost is one. There's impact fees. <clears throat> There's environmental issues when you're, when you're building. You've got rising labor and material costs associated with that. So it's just harder to add homes at scale than it is units of apartments at scale. So, um, and it, as you think about a lot of these households that have kids, want space, um, there, there's I think an interesting thesis that uh, the housing stock, the single family housing stock will likely be undersupplied relative to demand for those homes, whether they're homes for sale or homes for rent. Um, so I think that's something to, to keep in mind. Okay, um, so let's talk about some of the strategies uh, for investors um, and, and some of the implications. So I think always kind of, you know, prepare, hope, hope for the best, prepare for the worst is kind of a great way to think about it. Just remember that the trees don't grow to the sky. There, there will be times when um, things are, are a little bit tougher. So, so just think about what a downturn might look like in, in the markets you're thinking about and prepare for those. And I think, um, uh, think about your leverage strategy. Um, Long-term rates, as I mentioned, are still very attractive. So if you plan on owning something long enough, um, a little bit of a decline in home prices doesn't matter um, because as Rich will talk about in the slides, um, when, when, when he starts talking about the single family rental market, um, there's, there's some pretty good downside protection from rental income generally in downturns. We, we, do, we do expect, uh, I think most economists feel that this next recession will likely be a mild one, a, a cold versus pneumonia. Um, it's, it's probably more of a dip than a crash. The, the last one felt very different. When you look at a lot of the fundamentals, it was a, driven by a credit bubble and a lot of things were really out of whack. Um, I think here you're just sort of getting, we're, we're getting more toward the natural end of a, of a business cycle. Um, and, you know, it's extending probably a bit longer than expected because of some of the, some of the things that, that um, have, has been done to sort of continue that, but it's likely to be a more of a modest correction. And I would say also think about property types and how the different property types will likely fare in, in a recession. Um, things like office space, for example, uh, may be impacted worse than things like rental housing, um, I would argue, because uh, everyone needs a place to live. And um, if, if employers are cutting jobs, then uh, perhaps there, there's not as much of a need for office space and more and more people working from home, et cetera. So there's some of these longer term trends to think about if you're thinking about allocating capital across different real estate property types. Um, and then also remember that, that um, opportunity can emerge from, from downturns. Um, I mentioned my last company, uh, we really formed it in the depths of the last real estate downturn and started buying houses um, and created what, it, what turned out to be a company out of that opportunity. But real estate is cyclical. Uh, and uh, just keep in mind that Generally, um, at least historically, prices have come back in most markets. And if you can see past the, you know, what's in front of you, a lot of times um, when things are seeming the most dire is, is the best long-term opportunity as long as you have the right time horizon. 
So I, I would also say um, there are technology and, and tools that you, that you can use that, that really are opening up more opportunities for you. Um, there's an increasing amount of information you could get access through, through your desktop and phone to, to enable you to invest more broadly and create a real diversified footprint uh, for your exposure. Property management can be outsourced um, and, and third-party property managers are getting much better than they were, say, a decade ago, given you know, a lot of the tools that they have at their exposure or at, you know, at, at their, um, at, uh, for their, their availability. And then finally, smart technology um, is, is helping. Um, so you've got things like leak detection that you can that you, you could um, have under your sinks and you've got remote monitoring of the temperature of the homes that you have and things like that so you can make sure um, there are no issues. So there's a, all sorts of cool stuff that's happening that, that's making um, this easier and more efficient for, uh, for investors to own remotely. So there's a couple strategies, and then I'm going to turn it just to uh, you know, leave you with, and then uh, Rich is going to talk a bit about the SFR market. And so um, when we think about the roof stock, what's different about the roof stock marketplace, we like to say you can sort of buy anywhere from your easy chair. Um, that's the idea. You could be sitting anywhere uh, in the world, really, and looking at homes all over the United States and buying typically where you don't live and relying on our tools and our infrastructure. So you, the, the idea for us when we started the company was to take the best of what we built in our large institutional platforms and make it available to uh, investors who um, might just be getting started or might be sophisticated. So, um, and by the way, we're always open to feedback as to what you guys like about our site and what you don't, what's intuitive, what's not. But um, it's it's challenging to build build tools that are simple enough for everyone to understand yet robust and advanced enough to where if you're a power user you can actually get real value out of them as well so we're trying to offer both and offer a relatively simple uh, interface but then the more you want to dig in the more you can dig in with more analysis and things like that um, but, you know, you can underwrite your returns, review the condition of the property, inspection reports, compare neighborhood and school scores, um, things like that, and, and look at images, um, and then um, really be able to compare uh, properties across markets uh, and, and, and buy in an online environment, uh, which makes it much simpler than having to fly places and um, make offers and find local contractors and property managers. The idea here is it's, we've sort of created the real estate investment cloud for you. You can plug into our, our um, site and our infrastructure, and it's a combination of being able to do things with technology or talk to people. We know some people um, still like to have a live person to communicate with, that's great. We have, we have people to do that. Others like to just do it on their own. And, and not have, ever have to talk to anybody. Uh, we have plenty of clients who do that too and, and everything in between. And there's great financing uh, today, as I mentioned, for this strategy. Uh, Fannie and Freddie have very attractive uh, lending programs and you could finance typically up to 80% of uh, your purchase um, through them. And then um, the other strategy uh, is, is more of a set it and forget it strategy. So think about our marketplace uh, as being where you're picking the homes that you want, you're taking title to them, you might be getting a loan, you might you, you get your own insurance and you pick your property manager, et cetera. So we make it much easier and we break down the geographic barriers, um, but you still are, you have that control as a landlord and, and many people like that to be able to have that influence. Some uh, though are, are more passive and want more of a set, a set it and forget it strategy. And we, we got this from some of our customer research as we simply called people who um, hadn't purchased on the site, but were very active on it. We got a lot of feedback that, hey, I really love the single family home idea of investing in it, but I don't really have a lot of time and I don't really wanna to have to get my own loan and I don't wanna to have to deal with anything. 
picking a property manager. So we created a product called Roofstock One, which is a way for uh, investors to buy shares of homes that we have purchased at Roofstock. Um, we, we may oversee the renovation, we oversee the property management and make sure it's insured and financed and all that. And, um, and we sell off the equity. And uh, so you could buy 10th shares of those homes. And so th this, this product today is only for accredited investors. Um, we're looking to um, hopefully offer that to non-accredited investors um, later this year. No promises, but we're working on that. So, for, but for now, it's for accredited investors. So um, it's uh, completely sold out. So we we our, our launch that we did last year, um, the, all all the shares are sold. So it's a good sign that there there is real interest in that, and we we look to uh, introduce more properties um, hopefully later this quarter. So you could go to um, uh, roofstock1.com slash one and uh, get more details. Okay, so with that, I'd like to introduce uh, my good friend and co-founder, Rich Ford. Uh, I've known Rich um, since 2011. Uh, we actually were on a panel together um, and in the very early days of the single family rental um, industry being being formed and rich and i got to know each other then uh, he worked at jeffrey's at the time and ended up uh, we worked together for many years um, after that when i was uh, running starwood waypoint he actually uh, helped take us public as an investment banker so i'll turn that over uh, to rich great thanks thanks gary So I'll try to be, oh. testing, is that okay? Can everyone hear me online? Thank you, Gary. Um, I can add to my bio slide advancer for, for Gary Beasley. Uh, I'll chat with him afterwards if, if, if that worked okay. Um, yeah, really quickly, first of all, oh, sorry. Okay, well, first of all, thank you all for coming. This is excellent to have everybody here and I understand there's a lot of people online as well. Um, so we look forward to quickly getting to the question. If I fall, let me know. Do you want me to just go to a handheld mic? I'm happy to do that. Great, thanks. That's way better. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so so I'm going to talk about the why now, as far as investing in this asset class. But I'm going to I'm going to start a little bit talking about the why then. I was I've been in a fortunate position to probably advise on getting close to 20,000 um, properties um, sold in the single family rental sector over the last eight years or so. It started off, as Gary mentioned, when I was doing investment banking. So I've had an opportunity to look at this class through some of the most sophisticated investors in the space. A lot of those deals obviously were large institutional transactions. We actually just completed an over, you know, a deal for over $200 million um, just, uh, just before the holidays. So we continue to have all that insight into what institutional capital is doing in the space. And as Gary mentioned, you know, one of the goals of our, of our platform is to be able to take all of that knowledge and skills and underwriting expertise and distill it and put it in a format where anybody anywhere in the world can utilize it. And you know, I'm gonna talk about why now, but maybe I'll start with talking about why then. This asset class has been around forever. There's about 16 million rental homes in the US. Um, rental market, as Gary said, is, has moved in the 60% um, level home ownership to, to 30, you know, mid to high 30s for, um, for, for rentals across apartment buildings, smaller units, and, and the rental family space. But the, um, you know, but the space was very fragmented, still is very fragmented. Even all those institutional owners still only own a few percent, three, you know, three to 400,000 of the homes are, are held by them. In hindsight, it looked really easy. You know, eight, nine years ago, you know, when we all look back to where the prices were, it was a no brainer. If we could go back, we'd buy up as many homes as we could uh, in this investment class, but it wasn't, um, you know, 
it, it wasn't as easy as that back then. We had this perfect storm of the financial crisis creating an entry point where the home prices were low enough and technology advancing enough where people felt comfortable that they could manage homes from afar or manage a scattered plot of homes even within a city. Um, but there was no financing. Nobody really knew what the cash flows were going to be off these properties. Was was all that rent going to evaporate through all the expenses that would be required to manage these properties? And you know, fortunately, people felt that the entry point was low enough to jump into it. What's happened um, over the last several years, as you all know, is the home prices have appreciated. So no longer are those opportunities um, are, are homes at 50% of replacement value. But what has happened is we've advanced a lot. The financing markets are very robust, both for institutional transactions as far as as well as individual transactions. The operational side is, um, for the most part, fairly fleshed out. There's still a lot of advances that will be made. Lots of cool technology companies here, in the in, even in the Bay Area, are um, doing all sorts of things that are going to make these properties more and more efficient. But we we're no longer as scared by the returns, and we're going to go through a slide that will sort of help distill how you can sort of go from rent to the net cash flow that you'll get off the properties. Um, and uh, and we, you know, we also know that we can manage properties across lots of different states and underwrite them fairly successfully from, from lots of different places. So overall, the reason that I think this is a very interesting asset class, and I was fortunate enough to spend 20 years in investment banking working across all of the different real estate classes, um, and you know, I think this quote, it may be one that Gary had originally, but I've stolen it here, is that you know, I, I kind of look at these single family rental homes as, as sort of a bond with an equity kicker. You've got a, a nice stream of cash flow coming off of it. And it's actually an inflation adjusted bond to get precise because these are yearly rents for the most part. We should talk about that in, in the, in the Q&A. I think there's some strategies where it may make sense to lock in longer leases, but they're yearly rents that can reset. Um, so you can have growth from that. But you also have the home price appreciation. And this asset class is kind of unique in that there's also kind of an embedded option. Most real estate classes, an office building, you know, you're not really, there's been a few models played around with, but you're not really going to break it up and, and, and sell it in little pieces or sell it to a to completely different um, type of investor. These single family rental homes, you know, are also homes that people could live in um, for that that own them. So they could be a rental product, but they could be an owner occupied product as well. And so you have a, this cash flowing investment, but there's also an opportunity if you want, if it made sense in the future, to sell that home um, to a to a homeowner. Um, so I, I, that's that's very attractive. I do think uh, we'll have a slide on here that talks about the return adjustments compared to the stock market and such. But I think the more the more important point is it you know it is a diversification. If you look across most institutional asset classes, people have their stock portfolio, they have their bond portfolio, and they have a real estate portfolio. You know, previously you had to either invest also in the stock market to get to the real estate through REITs, or you had to be fortunate enough to be very wealthy and invest in one of these big real estate funds, um, which was not made available to everybody. What I think is kind of cool, one of the things we're doing is we're allowing people to diversify across into a new asset class on a fairly granular basis. And as Gary said, you know, originally, um, Roofstock one is 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 set because it's a security for accredited investors, but we're even going to try to bring that down so you could put smaller increments into the asset class, and hopefully more to come on that later this year. Um, I'm not going to get into the tax efficiencies, uh, and I don't. I think on Roofstock we'll probably be careful to to uh, to state that. One of the things though that is super cool about this space, if people here and there's, I'm sure a lot of people here are from California, may be familiar with 1031. This is an exchangeable um, product, so you could chain, exchange your tax basis from a, one investment property over to a new investment property. It's very granular. Um, that's something if, if people want to learn more about that, we have folks um, here on the sales team and such that could um, elaborate, but it's, it's, a, it's a pretty, pretty cool um, attribute with regards to single family rentals. And, you know, as, as Gary said, I'm going to, I'm going to come up with a, uh, show a slide in a little bit about the defensible um, nature of this. But I think the more important part is that these rents, you know, home prices will go up and down, and that that will happen specifically in certain certain markets. But you know, the rents are pretty sticky, and we'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a couple of slides. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because it's really hard to generalize um, the single-family rental um, uh, 
profile versus versus multifamily. Uh, you know, for the most part, yes, um, folks tend to be a little bit older. They tend to have more kids. Um, a lot of places there's a little bit more income and 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 such. But you know, I could come up with I could look at downtown San Francisco, an apartment building with someone that's got really high income and kids and choosing to live there, and and I could go out to a suburb um, and have and, and have a very different effect. But that's you know, at, at a high level. Um, this is a rental asset, and I think one of the most important things is that there's there's no longer a stigma associated with renting. I think in the Bay Area we've all sort of known that, but you know th throughout the U.S. I think people are just choosing to be renters if they want to be renters and have the flexibility. And I think we'll continue to see a lot of demand for this product type. Um, the, as Gary mentioned, there's there is a lot of workforce housing that's going to need to be developed, built. A lot of homes that are currently owner occupied are going to be need to be transformed, um, and that um, you know those those factors are going to play well for the long term investor. Oops. One thing that I do think is important to note, because this is a this is a big difference between um, multifamily and single family, is is the tenants tend to be, and we, we like to call them residents, so I'm gonna say tenants once and then I'm gonna refer to them as residents because they really are part of this equation. And I think the more we treat um, our residents as part of this investment equation, um, it's the better for everybody. Um, they do tend to be stickier in that, and I, you know, a lot of people here I'm sure have a garage full of stuff. I've moved several times over the last uh, seven years and it is very painful every time to, you do it. I think you get more embedded in your community when you own or rent a home. So the kids are in schools, there's dog parks nearby, the church. Um, so we do have this dynamic where these single family renters tend to stay in place longer. Where this is gonna be important is with as you look at rent growth. We'll, we'll, we'll get to it in a little bit, but the, there's, there's this equation about do you increase the rents and in, improve your yield on, on owning this asset or do you leave that good tenant in place and not push it too much. The, the other factor that's important is it does cost more money to turn a single family rental home than an apartment unit. So you know you may wanna push the rents and maximize the yield on that property, but if you increase your turnover and you have tenants and residents coming in more and more um, frequently, they're gonna increase your vacancy and, um, you know, and your turn costs. This is a slide that Gary referred to earlier that I think is incredibly important, and I know it's really hard to read back there. So I think the, the most important thing to note is the, this is, this is over the last 20 years almost, the, the orange bars are the rent, and the gray bars, the growth in rent, and the gray bars are the appreciation of the homes. So even in the financial crisis, when all of this distress was happening, rents were pretty sticky. Um, you know, people needed a place to live, um, and you know, conversely, you know, when things are strong, it was, you know, it, it's also really hard to push rents crazy. I do think multifamily is very interesting in that it's very institutionally owned, and there's all sorts of yield optimization software out there and such. So I still feel fundamentally that the single-family rental space, on a rent per square foot, however you want to measure it, still has a lot more room for growth. I think people have been a lot of people. There's out of those 16 million homes, 8 million are owned by an individual. Um, and it is a little scary to push your rents. And when we've had this, you know, upward trend, you know, you'll you'll leave them if the whole market's leaving rents in a certain spot in the single-family rental homes. That makes it harder to push. So it's nice to look to multifamily and see how how high the rents are per square foot. I think that allows for a lot of growth. But as you and property managers will look at this asset class, that's a you know that's a calculus part of the calculus that you'll have to have to bring into effect. We're going to probably talk a little bit about cap rates and net income. That you don't need to know all that, but just you know, just by way of um, this graph, I mean, really, all we're talking about when we're talking about a yield, whether it's a cap rate or or, or, or a net yield or a gross, is we're talking about the income over the value of the property. And so, when people talk about how high the cap rates were back here, it wasn't because the um, the rent spiked up to some crazy spot. It was because the home prices had dropped. And you know, now we're at a spot where you know, cap rates are at a more normalized level. The home prices have back have appreciated back, and we've got you know again this consistent cash flow that's that's growing.
I'll spend a minute on this, not too long. I was an investment banker for 20 years. I could play around with this graph in a million different 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 ways. Um, I think the the key the key part that I'd like to emphasize here is is two things. One is diversification is good. And what's really nice about this asset class is it's not like you have to save. You, know, you don't have to get 10 friends together and all your money and put it into one big apartment building or an office building. It's a fairly granular asset. So you can diversify across markets and over time. So you don't have to put all your investment dollars in at one time into one asset in one market, particularly with the fractionalization of Roofstock One and other things that we'll have coming. People will even be able to spread out their investments over a longer period of time, over longer markets. And I just think that's a good fundamental investment strategy. If you're super smart and you have a crazy good bet on one thing and you see a, a great opportunity that's good but just appreciate that you you know there's a risk reward trade-off to making to making those bets the second thing that i think is is really important is um you know the stock market's a stock market is affected by a lot of things um you know, obviously the underlying value of the assets or the performance of the company is a factor but it also will move due to all sorts of events that none of us can project um, you know, we, you, you will see the REIT space, which fundamentally owns real estate, those stock prices can move up and down based on all sorts of macro events from, you know, ones that obviously are more related like interest rates, but also other factors that aren't as related, just cash flow coming in and out of the sector, people moving more money into one spot or the other. And so what is nice about um, this asset class is it's, it, it, it's something that, we don't have to look at that every day. If, particularly, I think we're going to talk a little bit about time horizons later. But if you've got a longer term time horizon and you've got a steady stream of cash flow and you have a view on home price appreciation, it's a good place to have some capital. You're not having to worry about it going up or down in a margin account or you know, refinancing. Um, Let's talk about an individual property. And I know there's some people here that own re rental properties and are super sophisticated and have all this, but just, just, just to simplify it a little bit for, for everyone and myself included, what you'll see on our site, gross yield, or maybe you'll hear people talking about it. Um, all that really is, is the rent divided by the value of the property. So just to make it really simple, let's say we have a property in Indianapolis that's a $120,000 property and it has $1,000 a month in rent. So that's $12,000 a year. It's a $120,000 property. So that would produce a 10% gross yield. What I like about gross yield is there's a, when people get to net yields and cap rates, there's a lot of assumptions on the expenses and performance of the property. So it becomes a little bit subjective. Gross yield's not subjective. It's what's your rent times 12 divided by the value of the property. So it is a it is a good metric to look at. Now you have to take into account that the expenses are different across the markets. Taxes in Texas are higher than taxes in Alabama. And so it won't be a perfect translation from gross yield to net yield. And that's something that our site really helps people talk about. So let's let's talk about net yield. And sometimes this will be referred to cap rate. There's things called capital expenditures that can affect what people use. But really just thinking about going from a gross yield to a net yield. The net yield is, for the most part, the cash flows that you're gonna receive off the property. So that $1,000 in rent, when we take into account taxes spread out over 12 months, insurance, repair and maintenance, some vacancy factor, um, and um, you know, some, some normalization of leasing expenses and such, maybe that's $400 a month. Now it's not gonna be each month, but let's just say on average, it's about $400 a month. So you've got $600 of cash flow. So that, that's producing a, a net yield of 6%. So our 10% our example, or we had $1,000 rent, went down to went, went down to 6%. So that's, that's sort of your bond part. That's the, the cash flow that's coming in on average. Now we add leverage to the factor. The beautiful thing about real estate, it is, it is leverageable. And I, you know, I'm not gonna project where rates are going, but I just spent, um, not last week, but or not this week, but the week before in New York, and I met with all of our investment banking colleagues. And you know, there's a lot of capital that likes this sector. For you know, and, and I see that what happens with the institutions follows through. So there, there's life companies, there's um, um, lending to the sector. Uh, there's awesome securitizations going on at great rates. So there's a there's a lot of debt capital, and that's something that we should all be able to take advantage of. One of the things Roofstock's trying to do is 
bring cheaper and cheaper debt capital, make it smoother um, for folks on the retail side. So you've got now 6% and depending on the leverage level, so there's two things that are important on putting the debt on, what's the interest rate and how much, you know, is it 70% loan to value, 80% loan to value? Um, let's, let's assume that we use something, you know, that's like 75% loan to value and let's say our rate is, yeah, sub five, getting, getting close to five. And, and, you know, you could easily then turn your 6% return into an 8% cash flowing return over time. Now let's, you know, talk about the IRR, which is something, which is a term that nobody needs to know, but it's really just sort of what's the, what, what does your investment look like from over the full time horizon when I take into account cash flows and the appreciation for when you, you sell the security or you sell the home. And the thing that's important to note here, you know, first look, it may look like, oh my goodness, you guys are talking about, you know, five, six percent home price appreciation compounded. That, you know, we already had that. You know, I'm not sure that's going to happen going forward here. Um, you do need to take into account leverage here. So if let's even say it was 50% leverage and we were assuming there was a 2% home price appreciation, you know, that's 4% to the equity. And so, you know, I think that, you know, we've had some IRRs that have been much higher than this. I I, I think this is a you know, again, I should probably read a whole disclaimer ahead of this. this is just to use as an example, but you can, I just wanted people to sort of be able to go through from the rent all the way through to what the return may be. Obviously the return is highly dependent on your time horizon. And I, and I think this is an asset class that lends itself to being held for, for a long period of time. So we're gonna quickly get, get to Q and A. Um, you know, just, j just to wrap up, um, why now? Um, I've never been great at predicting markets and timing and all those and all the macro, macroeconomic factors. I do think if you're good at that, there may be a, a jumping in spot that's better than than not. Obviously, if home prices are lower and rent growth is on the upswing, that's a good time. I think more importantly, you know, this is a proven asset class, and if and, and if some of your capital you want to put into something that has some yield and has some upside potential. Um, that's great. And again, I would diversify across markets and I would diver diversify across timing of your investment. Um, I do think that uh, we, you know, we are probably going to come into a year where, where the stock market is going to continue to get more volatile, um, may continue to, to, to improve. I mean, I've been very surprised with how strong it's been this year. Um, and that is, you know, that's something that some people have the stomach for or not. But I, I do think what's, you know, this is, I look at this as a, another asset class, just like the bond market, where it's a good place to have some some capital. So, in summary, um, you know, we we think that this is we we've obviously everybody at Rootstock here thinks that this is an, a great asset class and it's going to continue to t and, and continue to grow. We think there's going to be more institutional investment. We think there's going to be more consolidation between retail investors, um, and our goal is to sort of be in the middle of that and provide people with all of the information to make wise investment decisions. Whether, and we've talked a lot about buying, but also with selling. There's good times in the market to sell, you know, sell homes and then redeploy capital um, into other areas. So with that, I think we're ready to go to Q&A and, and Gary is, is available there and I can, um, you're mic'd up still Gary, right? Can we, can we are, is it able, are we able to have both of us? I know a lot of people around the office would like to have that mute function normally, but um, it only happens when I'm remote. So we'd love to take some questions. My question is, um, what is your response to people who think, who look at turnkey investing as a way to not have to do due diligence when investing in real estate? So are, are people familiar with that term turnkey investing? So basically the asset has been stabilized. Um, there's a, there's a, there's a, a resident in place. Um, the renovations have been done. You're just sort of stepping into an asset like most of the assets on our site, although some will, you know, some that will require deferred maintenance um, and, and, you know, viewing that as maybe versus an investment where, you're buying a home that needs to be renovated and has maybe never been leased before, so you're you know, you know so you're uncertain. Gary, Gary do you do you want to go first? Or you want me to jump in? Uh, go ahead. Once you start, and and um, got a couple more questions as well. So why don't you take this one? And if, uh, if there's anything I want to add, I will. So this is that sort of risk reward part of the equation, right? Um, 
what I like about turnkey is that I, I kind of know what I'm coming into. The, the lease is already in place. I'm not making a guess if the rent's $200 more or $200 less. Um, you know, there's always going to be repair and maintenance needed on, on these homes, but the big renovation, if there was one needed, has been done. And so I know what I'm coming into. I'm going to have cash flow day one. And, you know, I probably have a good shot at a nice single and maybe a double, um, but I'm not going up to the bat not knowing if I'm if I'm going to strike out or hit a triple or, or a home run. So it's a, so it, if you're sort of looking for something that's you know more stable and more safe, um, but still has you know great potential, that's great. You want to swing for the fences a little bit, and there's a lot of people that do this. I know a lot of people that have made a lot of money, um, you know, buying a a property that needs a lot of work and that that maybe has never been rented before. You know, you generally you're taking more risk. So the chances are that if it all works out, your return is going to be better. Now, the flip side of that is if it doesn't work out, you know, re your your return could be poor. And so there is a time to make that. I would argue that be careful doing that from afar. Um, you know, the nice thing about Rusag, you can invest in a property on the other side of the country that's more turnkey, and you know what you're getting into. If you're trying to manage a process from the other side of the country that needs a massive renovation and lease up, um, it's 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 a little more complicated. Those tools aren't necessarily available online. Is that helpful? I, I would just add, um, when you're buying a turnkey property, I would say not all turnkey uh, platforms or assets are created equal. You, you still need to do diligence on the asset and the market and think about and just realize that you're buying retail not wholesale so you will be the, the middleman will be taking profits and in some cases with turnkey operators they will take massive markups 20 or 30 percent uh over their cost basis and, and so if you're going to buy a turnkey property make sure you're benchmarking it also against what what is the fair market value of, of the asset it's possible, and I'm not saying this happens oftentimes, but sometimes turnkey operators will put um, renters in at an artificially high rent by giving them incentives up front. So imagine you're getting two months of rent free and you're paying 15 or 20 percent above market, um, and then someone comes in and buys the asset based on that level. So make sure it's a fair market rent and make sure you're benchmarking against uh, the underlying value of the real estate if you're buying a turnkey property. Great. Yeah, I mean, just to, just to add on that, I mean, the, the, the turnkey, there's kind of a, a couple flavors of that. There's people out there that are really producing these to Gary's point, and you do have to be careful. You know, I would argue that our, our site provides sort of different levels of what I would call turnkey. You know, that the investments for, for the most part are, are tenanted, um, have cash flows producing, you'll be able to see what the deferred maintenance and maintenance is and such. And so there's a way to play between those two spectrums. You know, the, the, the group that's really sort of trying to deliver it on a silver platter that again, may be charging you for that delivery and the vacant property that you're sort of doing it, you know, there's, there's a whole spectrum in between where you may want to take a little risk and purchase a property on our site that has some deferred maintenance and some rental upside. So you're taking a little bit of risk to get that additional return. Or you may want to go to the other side of the, side of the spectrum and take a property that's got, you know, a nice stable cash flowing return, is newly built, or has, um, you know, very light repairs and maintenance required. And does a roof stock deal in fourplexes, and how do they behave? Do they behave more like single families or like multifamilies with regard to uh, tenant profiles and turnover? Great question. Um, so the, the question was on fourplexes, and you know we have more recently started selling some duplexes and fourplexes. Above that, we've held off for the time being because then you start getting into you know backup generators and all sorts of things that are required in, in multifamily. Um, I, I personally really like duplexes and fourplexes because you've got you know two to four streams of cash flow coming off the property. So at any one time, if you have a vacancy, you know you still got income coming coming in. Um, they, you know, again, you are making a more concentrated bet than purchasing four different homes because it will be all driven by you know, the performance in that in that area and, and of that asset. But I, I, I think over time you will see Roofstock sort of offering more and more opportunities, you know, into that mini mini multifamily, you know, layer. Um, and so you'll probably see us be putting up more and more duplexes and fourplexes. If you look at the world, I think it's 
break down the whole rental uh, market in the US, I think about one third is single family rental homes, one third is the big apartment buildings as, as we all think of them, and then there's about a third of the market that's you know from duplexes up to 20, you know, 20, 30 unit um, buildings. There's a massive market opportunity there, and that's something we'll spend some more time on. I don't know, Gary, if you have more to add there. Nope, I think you I think you answered it well. Okay, we have a, a couple of questions that have come in uh, through the system. Um, one uh, is, what if I'm a realtor or turnkey provider or fix and flipper and want to figure out how to partner with Roofstock? So that's a great question. Um, we partner with lots and lots of groups who are creating inventory to use our platform as a, as a marketing platform. So if you are a turnkey provider, you're doing a lot of the hard work and you're tenanting your homes and want to look at Roofstock as a channel to sell them, it's fantastic because what we're trying to do is get more and more interesting inventory um, that our our um, clients can look at. Um, so, and uh, Suresh, who's speaking next, um, anyone could could talk to him. Uh, we've got Chris Willard. I don't know if Chris is there today, but we have uh, lots of programs to to work with um, fix and flip uh, groups and turnkey providers. Okay. Um, I got a, there, any other live live questions there? Or? Oh. Yeah. Hi. Thanks. I had a question around your Roofstock One program. You you piloted this in four cities. Was there any reason why you chose Atlanta, Dallas, uh, Indianapolis, and one more? Sure. So, so Roofstock One, I'll let Gary jump in here as well. Just for those, I know we Gary hit on it quickly, but what we realized is we had a lot of people coming to our site that had a lot of decisions to make, choosing the property, property manager financing. We decided to bundle all of this up and create a product where we would hold title, so nobody would have the personal liability of that home or financing in their name. We would wrap it with the uh, property management and financing, insurance, et cetera. And then we were able to create this into a security where we could then sell it in one tenth. So you could buy a tenth of a home. Um, and that that product, as Gary mentioned, has been, we, you know, our beta has been pretty successful and look, you know, we'll be expanding on that quickly and, and, and more to come. Um, you know, with regards to the markets that we started in, we, we started in some markets where we had, um, you know, property management presence and, um, we felt there were some good opportunities. The product should work across almost every market and we're exploring all sorts of different avenues, but we, in order to just launch and be somewhat focused, we just chose a couple of markets that had a few different attributes and different return profiles. And those are all markets that we you know, have, do a fair amount of um, business in and we thought were, were good markets. I don't know, Gary, if you have more to add about future markets and such. No, I think you summed it up. Um, over time, we, we expect to offer Roofstock One in lots of different types of markets. And um, what we picked were all markets that have pretty healthy rental dynamics and a good good growth prospects. And we specifically pick um, certain neighborhoods and things like that that we feel are very conducive to long-term rental property ownership and appreciation. But there are dozens and dozens of markets around the country we, we think uh, could work quite well for uh, if not hundreds, uh, ultimately, for Rusak one. Are we, are we up on time or is there one? Sorry, MJ, what? One more question here, sure. And and by the way, I mean, we're a lot of it. There's a lot of people from Rustock. I'm going to be here all day. I mean, I'm hoping we're going to be able to answer a lot of questions one on one um, throughout the day. So quick question on how do you structure your rental business if you want to have multiple properties and be able to take uh, advantage of writing off the property expenses and the interest on your taxes because there's a limitation on an, an individual if your income is over $150,000 it really tamps that down so how would you structure your business so that you could still take advantage of those write-offs Gary you want to take a shot at that or? You know, I'd like to, it's probably a better conversation to have with your tax advisor, your financial advisor. We're, we're not in a position to really give uh, 
business structuring and tax advice. Um, there are different things you, you can do um, to take full advantage of, of the tax law, but it's probably not something that we should go into in a, in a setting like this. With, with regards to the management side of it, you know, I, I do think that's one of the things that it, it, it is nice as far as the way we're set up. It, you know, you do have the ability to invest into, in different markets and, you know, whether if it was through the Roofstock One product, obviously that's all, be all, all um, reporting and everything can be fairly simply done. Uh, if you're sitting here and you want, you, there, we have different certified property managers in each of the different markets. So you can have, you know, it's pretty easy to develop a diversified strategy, but I, you know, I, I agree with Gary with regards to the specific, and I'm happy to talk to you one-on-one -on -one too, but with regards to, you know, specifics on, you know, on, on tax planning and write-offs and, and, um, you know, again, I think 1031 is a pretty um, interesting opportunity if you have existing properties and you're thinking about selling them and, and, and transferring that tax basis into other assets. You know, we can talk to you a little bit about that too. I think we need to sort of stay on track here, but as, as I mentioned, um, we're, you know, we're here throughout the day. We'll give you guys chances to stretch your legs and join different, um, um, you know, di different groups and be happy to answer any questions. Uh, again, thanks for sitting through, through this and thanks for folks online. Um, hopefully this was, was helpful and I look forward to talking to you more.